So this presentation is my own, about my own endeavors to sort of understand myself and understand my family, taking advantage of the fact that I've been working with genome research for about uh, quite a few years, and I've been working in a quite sort of research in intensive environment. So the first disclaimer is that all of the experiments, the data findings, you know, are private efforts. So my employer is not uh, related to this. Secondly, the individuals involved have provided informed consent to share their data. I think we're gonna go a little bit uh, into the privacy issues, what this means when you are dealing with your own personal genomic data. So I just wanted to do a small recap because as, as far as I understand, you guys are all mathematicians and computer scientists. If I am... Majority. We have a biologist as well. Well, so um, uh, you probably know this better than I do. Um, I just want you to know uh, a few key concepts before we go into details. So you probably know that we have uh, in each of our trillion cells of our organism, we have um, 23 pairs of chromosomes. So we have one pair for each chromosome. So one chromosome you get from your mom and another chromosome you get from, the, from your dad. And that's how we inherit, yeah? And a chromosome is a very tightly um, structure within the nucleus of the cell and basically it's composed of DNA and, and proteins. So uh, a gene, which is a segment of the chromosome, is actually embedded within the sequence. You've probably seen, um, of you may have been told that we have three billion letters of DNA. I call them letters, some people, you, you call them bases, haven't you? Um, so we have three billion letters, and actually if you put them and paste them in your Word file uh, font 12 uh, points, it would be something like 7,000 miles long put in a, in a sequence. So you could actually cross the Atlantic with that. And here is where the computing side of things becomes handy because that's what computers are good at. They're good at processing strings of, of information. So here you see on the, on the left-hand side the number of genes that each of the chromosomes have. We have in total 22,000 uh, genes. And here you see the length of each chromosome, how long they are in terms of these uh, uh, letters. So. When you look at the genome, actually, this is what you get. Uh, and this is a real sequence that I actually uh, put into my terminal and just uh, made a screenshot of it. And the, 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 some people call it the book of life, but in fact, that metaphor is slightly, I think it breaks because you know a book has chapters, has punctuation, it has words, it has spaces, whereas here, um, you don't have anything like that. And I think it's amazing that uh, the, the, the cell machinery is able to recognize what bits are encoding genes, what bits are not, what bits are regulatory regions, and it's all in there. Uh, and, and somehow encoded within the sequence, encoded in the chemistry as well, in the way uh, that uh, sequence is packed, in the way uh, the chemistry of what we call epigenomics, uh, how uh, compounds are then bound to those sequences of, I mean, of um, nucleotides. And this is something that has happened for the last um, 10 years, and is that there's been this convergence of the development of the internet and the, the explosion of data in, in the biological sciences. So I'm sure you are, you are all familiar with Moore's law, which says that, that the processing capacity of computers double every 18 months. Well, when you compare that with the capacity for us to actually produce sequence of DNA, sequencing DNA, is, is basically, and this, we are talking a logarithmic law. So you, you can see that this is explosive, completely explosive. So what, what's happened now is that um, we have an enormous capacity to be able to produce DNA sequencing. Uh, however, the computing is not able to catch up. And so now the problem is not actually the produce, uh, producing data, it's actually 
to handle that data, to interpret that data into uh, knowledge which is or can be translated into something useful. So why is the human genome really important? Well, because it's a reference tool. It's like having a Google Maps of our genes. We have coordinates in which we can map specific functional um, traits that we have found. And that can help us then understand how we work, how we live, how we uh, interact from in the environment. And there is something that I truly believe, and is that every trait, every illness, every, even your character, to some extent or another, is based or is affected by your genes, right? Some people uh, disagree, but uh, that's my personal opinion. So <clears throat> what we have passed in the, in the past 10 years have been from what we call analogic biology, uh, where you know, the way to actually look at our genetic information, you will go uh, <clears throat> into the doctors and go into under a mi microscope, and that would be what you would see. Whereas now, we are in a um, digital biology, whereby <clears throat> you can see every single point mutation of every single letter. And, and the variation of those letters, the variation of that sequence, or what we call mutations, is what is going to define our different uh, traits. That's why I look different to you. And, and that can be, to some extent, encoded in your own personal DNA. For example, <clears throat> this is just to give you an idea of what could be a genetic disorder. So um, here is a, a normal person, and here is a Down syndrome person. This was the first sort of genetic illness that was um, um, identified. And as you see, <clears throat> the Down syndrome patient has a um, duplication of chromosome 21. And that, having more genetic material uh, than what you should have, it makes that syndrome happen. I, I, like, I like to think about genes as a kind of symphony, you know? So if you, if you imagine those 22,000 genes as 22 different uh, instruments. And for this Down syndrome patient, you know, it, it, you could see that those genes that happen in chromosome 20, 21, those instruments, as if you could start, uh, you know, playing slightly faster than they should be. You know, when you have uh, those uncoordinated instruments in, a, in an orchestra, they start to, provide, to produce some kind of cacophony. And this is really what is happening. Uh, with, the, with this kind of um, uh, dis disorder, genetic disorder. This is just to show that we have uh, an equivalent of a Google map. Uh, this is one of them, one of the major ones, where you can actually zoom in, zoom out, and you can, you can navigate as if uh, for free, as if it was a, a, a Google map. So here is my personal story. Four years ago for my birthday, I decided to uh, by uh, a kit, a genetic uh, analysis kit. So you, you might have heard of this, 23andMe. So uh, you basically go on the internet, pay, in this, in this case, I pay $399. Uh, my, my wife was going to kill me uh, because she couldn't understand how the heck I could spend that amount of money on something that really didn't give me anything. And, um, and, and so you go on the internet, you pay, with your credit card, and they provide you with a spitting kit that um, you know you get maybe six weeks later, and you spit and send it somewhere to the U.S. And then when they are ready, they send you an email, and then you have your results. So this is just to show that I actually did spit, and um, and this is what you get, and this is this is what I actually got in my report. So I have. Uh, th the most interesting thing is that I have an increased risk of prostate cancer, so a 28.1% 20, risk of, of having prostate cancer, whereas the average um, Caucasian male risk is about 70%. So in fact, I have about 50% greater chance than average to have prostate cancer, right? But when I saw that, um, I was trying to sort of understand from a scientific point of view how the heck they got into this thing. First of all, because you know, um, there, is no, there is no history in my family of prostate cancer. 
And you know that the biggest predictor for you to have some particular disease is based on, uh, at least genetic disease, is based on your, your family, your, your inheritance. So I went slightly further, and then I, I found that this uh, probability is based on a number of SNPs, a number of point mutations that distributed across the genome that have been identified in the scientific literature to be correlated to prostate cancer. And so, it's a, so this is one letter, another letter, another letter. So again, if you look at back, if you think of the sequence, you know, one letter that has been changed, let's say an A that has been changed to a G or something like that, that's a, that's a SNP, okay? And this particular one, this particular SNP is the one that is the offending one, the one that is giving me the, the greatest negative sort of probability, okay? So I went slightly further and I wanted to see where, does, where, where is that located? You know, I want to know how they created, they created it. So um, I realized that um, that gene is actually next to a, 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 a sorry, that, that SNP is next to a gene called MSMB that happens to when you actually, it's called a tumor, tumor suppressor. So a tumor suppressor usually suppresses tumor, but it happens that that SNP apparently decreases the expression of tumor suppressor hence increasing the chances of developing prostate cancer, okay? But I found that that wasn't enough. I actually wanted to, to, to browse, is this all the information? How far can I actually uh, uh, go in understanding my own personal genomics data? So I want to browse my own genome. I want to check the provenance of results, and I want to understand how I inherited my traits, and the information that I was provided wasn't good enough for me because, as I say, I work in the genetics uh, environment and, you know, I, I know that there are other things available out there. So, I decided to create my own browser for navigating my genome, and this is what we came up with, uh, my career view, which is now published. And basically what I did, I downloaded the raw data, the raw half a million markers or SNPs that the company analyzed, and then I combined and mapped them against known gene names and known regions that have, you know, uh, been involved in cancer and so on. And this is what I found. So I looked at the MSM gene, which is the one that I mentioned that is affected by, by this point mutation, and it happens that uh, that particular SNP, that particular letter is According to this, is 56 letters before the start of the gene. So we know from the biological uh, point of view that the region which is just preceding the, the gene, is, it can act as what we call a regulatory region. It's a, it's a region where whenever uh, this gene is expressed, the molecular machinery goes stacks in there and then starts reading. And, and, and the sequence preceding the genome, preceding that particular uh, gene, actually determines how much that can be expressed. So in fact, it confirmed the result that uh, by being in the promoter region, in the regulatory region just preceding the gene, actually uh, can indeed affect how much is, the, is then expressed. So I would like you to remember that for that particular position, that SNP, that offending red bar, is a combination of TT. It's called TT. So that's the sequence that I have. Remember, we have two copies. Yeah? Um, could you repeat this? Did you download the 23andMe data? Yes. Or would you do any of your own sequencing? Um, for this, I downloaded the 23andMe data. Okay. And Remember, we have two copies, so that's why we have one copy for my mom, one copy for my dad. One of them is a T, the other one is a T, okay? And having TT in that position causes a, a decrease of expression of that gene. So more questions than answers. Is this real or is it an artifact? 
are my, actually, are my parents actually carrier? So the next thing I did was ask my family to actually go through this uh, 23andMe analysis. So this is me, and so I convinced my father, my mother, and my, my mother's sister to actually, uh, and my sister to undergo the, the, the 23andMe uh, analysis. We are all from here, from this part of, of southern Europe, quite close to Africa, and uh, uh, we, as far as I know, we've been there for generations, uh, at least four generations back. So we should be quite homogeneous in terms of, of the, um, of, of the genome, so to speak. So how did I inherit my prostate cancer risk? You know, now that I have my data from my family, I can actually compare. And this is something really interesting. You cannot see it from here, but it happens that for that, for that, um, can I yes, erase this? So it happens that for that particular SNP, my mom is a CT and my dad is a CT. And I inherited TT. So I inherited that and I inherited that, which in the genetic lottery makes me uh, a bit worse than my sister who inherited CT. Obviously, she doesn't have a prostate, but, um, uh, um, uh, you know, she, doesn't, she wouldn't be a, a, a carrier for, for that particular uh, trait. So I, when I saw that, I started getting really excited because this was, you know, starting to be a little bit scientific now. Um, but I, I, I keep on asking this question, is this all there is, you know? Um, you know, I, I really know my own li limitations. Uh, I cannot learn every technique, and I don't have time nor the resources to be able to understand all of the different uh, uh, available uh, tools for genome analysis. So could crowdsourcing work? And that's what we did. Um, so I started a campaign, a very strong campaign through my blog, uh, you know, publicizing, I, I wrote a, an article, we call it the corpasome, uh, because um, it's a kind of half, half jokingly saying, you know, all of the genomic information that we have for my family, we're, we're all sort of made it public and it's available for people to download. The only thing that we ask if they want is that if they find something useful, please email it to us and, and we'll, 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 you know, if, if we publish things, we will acknowledge you, we'll, you'll be a co-author. And it's, it's, it's worked really well because people seem to be so scared about um, putting their genomic data out there. I mean, I respect the, that, that opinion, but you know, I think that in our family, we would rather lose that pri privacy so that we can understand and learn a lot more. And, and you know, there is this sort of uh, view of genetic exceptionalism whereby you know it seems that if you make your genomic data available you know it's like you're giving your bank account details or, or things people are really going to know a lot about you and i don't really agree because even if you have a, a particular sequence of dna that you know could be associated to a particular trait there is never a black or white uh, answer to that you know you may have you may you may carry the genetic sequence and yet not develop the disease. So um, this is what we call genetic exceptionalism. And, and so we decided just to, you know, let's forget about those barriers and let's go to the bottom of this. You know, how far, if we, if we have a community behind and, and, you know, at the moment there are very few people who have been sequenced, who, had, who have put their genome, genome data out there. And there are many people, hobbyists, uh, who are developing their own interest on the internet. And so, um, what, what we did, we put all of our data in Figshare. Have you heard of Figshare? So Figshare is basically a resource where you can upload your figures, your data, etc. And the good thing about it is that once you upload something there, you have a DOI, so a digital object identifier. So you have a unique reference number that, that makes that particular um, figure or, or, or source citable, okay? And, and it's, you have a permanent digital object identifier. So that's, that's very useful. And it, it allows you to keep track of who has seen that data, how many people have uh, shared it via Facebook or, you know, so it's quite interesting. 
So how did crowdsourcing help? It helps. It helped quite a lot. Uh, so we learned things about our ancestry. So um, there is uh, a guy f m developing a project called e Eurogenes. And so he said that uh, my mom and my dad, who are the, logically the most distant, genetically speaking, from all the family, could, could, could be a good contribution to his already quite uh, impressive collection of, of genomes. And so it happens that this is my dad, which, cl which clusters quite neatly within the Spain and Portugal cloud. But my mom is a little bit of an outlier. And so that was quite interesting to see. Um, and again, you can see the difference. So south of Spain, one is my dad, and south of Spain, two is my, da my mom. Again, she's a slight, that ever so slightly different compared to other uh, similar um, people with the same genomes. Um, and, and again, uh, south of Spain one, and south of Spain two. South of Spain two, my mom, south of Spain one, my dad. I also learned about traits. So there is this um, open source res uh, resource called Snipedia, whereby uh, people can you know, annotate their genes. It's like a wiki, uh, kind of Wikipedia, but for SNPs. And um, this person, again, was developing a particular resource, and he wanted to publicize it. So he said, well, I'll analyze your, your family's genomes for free as long as I can show them as a demo. And, and so uh, this is my dad. And you know, he predicts that my dad is male. So that's, that's quite a good, um, uh, good thing. Um, it also, but if you look down here, it says that my dad is 77% likely to be lactose intolerant. And now I was thinking, gosh, dad, you never put coffee, you never put milk in your coffee, do you? You don't like yogurt, do you? So I don't know, I don't know if it was me trying to make something out of what I got or it was something really real. But anyway, I got excited about that, and I still think that, you know, until proof contrary, uh, I found something new, and something I can say in this kind of presentation. Uh, my dad is not bald. Good question. And I, I didn't say that on purpose. I didn't say that on purpose. But <laughs> so, so the other thing that I looked at is comparing, there is, a, a, uh, there is the love gene called oxy oxytocin. So if you have a particular variant, uh, ha it has been um, associated to friendliness. If you have another variant, it has uh, associated to the opposite of friendliness. So you can see that actually uh, G is friendly. Uh, well, they say that if you have a G, it's friendly. So the Africans is the fr is, are the friendliest of all. And then the Europeans and, and the least friendly are the Chinese and Japanese. Um, so I was wondering, oh, what's the oxytocin for, for my whole family for this particular SNP? And so I found that we are all friendly except my aunt, <laughs> unfortunately, which explains quite a few things. Um, now, uh, this is a distribution of red hair in Europe. So uh, red means over 10% of the population uh, has red hair. So. Um, and, and, and again, I'm from here, okay? So in principle, my, my chances of being red hair are, are quite low. But then I posted this uh, picture of my family on Facebook. And because I'm a geneticist, um, I have quite a few geneticist friends. And so one of my geneticist friends, he said, man, are you a carrier for red hair gene? I mean, how can you have three kids all red hair and your wife red hair and you, black hair. I mean, you must have red hair. In, in, in. So this was the, the Facebook conversation. Um, and I said, OK, fine. I actually sequenced my genome. But um, where, where do I look? And he said, well, have you looked at the MC1R gene? Uh, and I said, yes, OK, no, I haven't. So, but since I've sequenced my genome, I can, I can actually have a look. So this is the MC1R gene. And in fact, what we find is that my mom Sorry, this is me, this is my sister, and this is my mom, and this is my dad. So what happens 
is that for that SNP, for that particular position, you know that red hair is uh, recessive. You know what the difference is between recessive and dominant, more or less? So do, this is the, the, the typical Mend Mendel, Mendel law. So you have two copies uh, of a particular trait. He did it with peas, you know, uh, let's say yellow pea and um, uh, yellow pea and green pea. So if you have, for that particular gene, if you have uh, two dominant uh, copies, you are going to have, let's say, green. If you have green and yellow, actually, it would make sense if I, if I actually write it here. Okay. So let's say green is dominant and yellow is uh, recessive. So when you, when you made them, you have three, three combinations. You can have either, either um, you, can, you can have several combinations. You can have either GG, you can have GY, or you can have YY, right? So dominant means that you just need to have one copy for it to be expressed. And recessive means that you need to have the two copies for it to be expressed. So as I, as I found here, actually, I'm a carrier. So actually, I have a, I'm a carrier of red hair gene, except that one of my copies is also black hair. So, I, so that's why I express in my hair. But in fact, when I made it with my wife, we, um, uh, we have uh, uh, the, our genetic experiment ended up in, in three red hair offspring, which I don't know the, the odds of that is. So, so you need a larger data set. I need a larger data set, yeah. Um, although I'm not sure if I am biased somehow, but anyway. Um, the other thing that I, that I looked at, uh, and this was another, another publication, we were trying to look at the similarity between the genetic data among, among the different members of my family. So what I'm representing here is chromosome one. So you have each SNP or each letter is one pixel. Um, and then, you, so you have all of the chromosome one along here, and then all of the chromosome one along there. So when you compare my mom's chromosome one with her chromosome one, you have all are, all are identical. But then when you look at, when you look compare uh, my dad's and my mom, you see that there are more differences. Um, my one doesn't apply because I actually use different platforms. So this one is using a different, uh, more out of date technology. That's why you get quite a lot of gray pixels. So if you look at this, actually, I compared uh, my mom, my dad, my, uh, the, my sister, and my aunt. So you can see that the most different ones are between my mom and my dad. And if you look at, compare my mom and my aunt, you see that there are even a lot more similarity. So that, that was quite interesting to see. Um, the other thing that I did, actually, I compared that with an Indian person. So you can see that the Indian is actually the one that has greatest number of uh, red pixels, which is what we call different conflict. So that, that caught quite a bit of attention to the point that uh, an artist actually uh, decided to develop a blanket uh, with the visualizations of my sister genomes compared to my mom. So you have each, each figure here corresponds to one of the chromosomes. And it's now exposed in, in exposition at the Textile M Museum of Tilsburg in Amsterdam. So if you ever go to Amsterdam, see my blanket. It's my, um, the other thing I wanted to know, for example, is, you know, I always thought that my sister and myself are quite similar to my dad, but is that real or not? So now, uh, having the genetics, I can actually tell who is closer to that, my sister or myself. And actually, what I found is that my sister, which is here, um, when you compare my sister with my, with my dad, uh, they have, my sister have an 85% identity to my dad, whereas she's got an 84.8 identity, so 0.2% less than to my mom. And in fact, 
I tested this for significance, and for significance, and, and my sister is significantly closer to my dad than my mom. And I am equally significantly, uh, well, I'm equally related to my mom and my dad. So I think that that was quite interesting. The other thing that I wanted to look at um, was the different traits that are available in Snipedia. So I have things to do with, you know, uh, I cannot read that one, but you know, you have things related to cardiovascular diseases. You can see that there is clearly something going on on the maternal line. So you have each, each square, if it's, if it's blank, it means not present. If it's red, it means present. And see, here you have uh, traits that are either cardiovascular, related to cancer, metabolism, and, and miscellaneous. And so I, I, was, I was able to find that there is something going on on the cardiovascular front on my, on my maternal line. So that was quite interesting. The last thing I did, I actually sequenced my poo and, um, and, I, and, and the DNA. So that means that uh, everything that is contained in there uh, is going to be sequenced. So I'm going to find uh, all of the bacteria, fungus, uh, yeast, everything. And I also posted it. And so what I was able to find is the gut microbiota that exists in, my, in, my, um, in me. So not, not uh, surprisingly, the, the greatest uh, percentage are fecalobacterium of, of all of the different types of bacteria that, that exist in my, in, in my feces. So um, I'm going to uh, conclude. And I think that the intelligent exploration, experimentation, and trial to push the boundaries of knowledge are a right for ordinary people. I think uh, this is something that I've done on my own time. And I think, you know, as these kind of technologies become more available, uh, people are going to have the rights and the interest to get closer into this. The other thing is that, at least to me, sharing has been a lot more successful than keeping the data to myself because that allowed me. Uh, to, to learn many things that I would not have been able to otherwise. And also another thing is that privacy does not have to be incompatible with openness. So just to conclude, the final thought is that more availability of tests does not necessarily guarantee better access to personal genomics data. So because if you have all these data available and you don't have to, the tools to, to analyze them, then you know, they don't really do anything. So these are the people who have helped me, and um, thank you very much for having me.